I think I, I used to say that there was this little twisted little man inside me that wrote all this stuff, not me. Yeah. And he really was a twisted little man. <laughs> he was inside me. <laughs> and, uh, and I let him, I gave him great freedom. Today my guest is Joe Esterhaus. Joe was one of the most sought after screenwriters in Hollywood and to this day continues to develop scripts that are in popular demand. It's a much different writing style that he has now than the one that he wrote for many years ago that had a subject matter that we could say was less than controversial. Joe's story of faith and surrender to what God wanted him to be came through throat cancer but it's ultimately his role as father and his husband and child of God that continues to allow him to be a daily mass goer and somebody who wants to develop a further relationship day in and day out with his savior. So this is Joe Esterhaus. One of my favorite stories you told me once was about uh, after you wrote Fist and you went to the premiere and, and you were on the plane ride back and it was stormy. And there's a story, Norman Jewison directed Fist, and we were on the ride on the way back from the Dubuque premiere to Chicago in a little twin proper, it was a very small plane. And uh, some of the actors were there, Melinda Dillon was there, Kevin Conway. Um, and the, the storm was, everything was falling down and it was shaking the plane. And <laughs> Norman, who was a wonderful man, was very generous to me and a very feisty man, got up with everything rocking around and pointed to me and said, if we go down, I get the first paragraph. <laughs> and you, the screenwriter, you get the last paragraph. <laughs> you know, so Isn't that a, it's a good metaphor for life? It's oh, yeah, it typified the man, it absolutely is a good, good metaphor. Obviously, your lifestyle changed a lot when you moved back to Ohio. And you wrote the book Crossbear, and you talked about you know, your, your love of faith. Did you lose a lot of friends when that happened? Um, they all thought I'd go nuts, you know. I mean, yeah. I, I thought they thought I was weird to begin with, but suddenly I show up with a cross. It's hard right? to make people in Hollywood think that you're nuts. Not if you're me. <laughs> <laughs> so they, you know, they they just didn't understand it, and the yes, it did. Um, it, but but they cost, it cost me more acquaintanceships and friendships, I think, yeah. because the people that I was close to, and there were many of them, just figured, well, Joe is Joe, you know. So um, and, and it didn't happen that way. Um, the uh, but but there was a strain, you know, and the and then it was a strain on my part too because I was going through such an intense spiritual reconversion on all kinds of levels, and, and I was going to mass three times a week and doing all this reading that that I felt odd yeah. there myself yeah. in, inside, you know. So, um, but uh, I think for I think for me because there was a time in my life. Um, as a young father, uh, you know, we belonged to the country club and we had this nice lifestyle. And I probably spent more time at the bar, and not probably, I did, I spent more time at the bar with my buddies than, than I should have. But what makes me angry as I got older was is that none of those guys told me to go home. I don't, I don't blame them for keeping me there, but as older men who could have led me in the right direction, right. I get bitter sometimes thinking about why didn't those guys ever tell me to go home? You know, they, instead they wanted me to stay there and be the life of the party with them. And I, I think that when we have these friendships, at some point we begin to feel dirty about them because they're not leading us to what's good. They're leading us away from that. Whether they're pushing us that way or not, they're certainly not encouraging us to, to make good, wise choices. Incidentally, I have great respect for, for what you did with your life. Because you 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 went from the bar to the foot of the cross, and yeah. you didn't just talk; and you walked it in terms of what you're doing and what you did in your business success. And I and I truly admire that. Yeah, and and you too, Joe, because you you had to walk away from a lot. You had to change your writing style. You had to you know you had to to really repress the little guy inside that was writing certain things. The Holy and, Spirit overcame the damn well, little guy. You yeah, know, right. Well, well because he doesn't die, you just have to keep pushing him yeah, down sometimes. Yeah. For you, Hollywood's a place that really absorbs you. I mean, it, it becomes a living part of you. Right. 
How much of that became who you were, that you were giving so much of yourself to Hollywood that it was filling you with, uh, well, I don't want to say the sin, because that's not fair, it's not a cop-out, but... I was successful there, and, uh, and on a screenwriting level, no one had really had that kind of success. You know, I read, wrote 18 films, and, and uh, I did innumerable interviews, and, and uh, it became a very public figure as a screenwriter. And it does fill you up certainly with um, non-spiritual values um, yeah. the uh, but that the over the emptiness that I felt overcame that um, yeah. and, uh, and it was an increasing feeling of is this it is this all there is with that kind of success there is um, there's also a wonderful biblical phrase that I really love and I think it's very true it's the glamour of evil mm. you know and uh, and I was very attra attracted to that both in my writings and also in my personal life yeah. Do you mm. think that, was there a lot of influence in your Hollywood days and in writing the way that you wrote and was there a lot of anger evolved in that or was it just, mm. was it a creative license for you to create what you created in Hollywood? I think I, I used to say that there was this little twisted little man inside me that wrote all this stuff, not me. Yeah. And he really was a twisted little man. <laughs> he was inside me. <laughs> and, uh, and I let him, I gave him great freedom. Yeah. Um, the. Um, but certainly, to, to be serious, I think that had to be a part of it. Um, yeah. I overcame that anger, um, and, and I felt an increasing emptiness inside of me in, in Hollywood and in L.A. Um, and I was behaving in ways that I wasn't proud of. Um, and that led to, to 2001 and my throat surgery and my absolute sense of despair. Um, and having to stop smoking and drinking, which were both pillars of my life. Yeah. And I just realized that I couldn't do that without help. And that, was that's, there, that's really, really, really led me back to God. Was there a specific, you know, you talk about um, that there were things that you were doing that are outside of who you wanted to be. Were you able to recognize it at that time, or is it only when well, you look back that... Yeah, well, look, I had various addictions. I, you know, I, went, I had a cocaine addiction, um, I, and, and I, was, I was a classic functioning alcoholic. And there were, there were many mornings in my first marriage where I didn't know who was in the bed next to me. Right? And, and, uh, and there was always something that said, is really this the way you want to live with this mm. kind of... Uh, not just uh, physical and sexual promiscuity, the sort of promiscuity of the spirit, you yeah. know, in terms of my excesses. Yeah. And there was this little voice that said, "Are you paying attention to what you're doing?" Right. And uh, and finally, it all came together. And thank God, thank you, God, it came all together. Yeah. Right. I saw a sign on a church, and I love what this sign said because uh, I needed to hear it that day. And it said, "The truth makes us free, not comfortable." And you know, when we try to live out our faith, the truth isn't there so that we can go, hey, I can live the life that I want and I can do whatever I want and it's all going to be okay. The truth makes us accountable. Our faith makes us accountable. We can't just do what we want, when we want, how we want. We have to continually go back and we have to ask God to remake us. Oh. And the truth makes us free, not comfortable. We are made perfectly imperfect. God knows that we're going to have to return to him. God knows that we're going to have to come back to him every single day to confess not only what we did wrong, but to ask what we can do right tomorrow. To surrender back to him so that he can lead us in the direction that he wants. To be imperfect means that we were given this gift of free will and no matter how hard we try to do right day in and day out, unless we're allowing him to lead us, we're going to fall harder than we ever thought we would fall. That we were made by God for God to return to God. We were made in his image and his likeness to return to him someday. Which means that everything that we do that's apart from God, doesn't bring us joy. But there are points and times we're strong enough, we're willing to give ourselves over, we surrender to Christ and everything seems to be going well and then we fall. That's where we have to be merciful with ourselves. But most of the time it's easier to forgive somebody else than it is to forgive ourselves. 
My friends, at some point in our lives, we have to step back and just say, as in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And what that sentence really means is that when I get up to go to work, I will serve the Lord and be grateful for my job. When I put my kids on the bus in the morning, I will be grateful and I will pray that they will be kept safe. When we do everything as a family together, we will do it to serve God. Now, that's the easy part to say that. But to surrender, to give them everything. If you've ever handed your life over to Christ and asked him to take the wheel, Carrie Underwood, she sang that song, Jesus Take the Wheel. She had no idea what she was saying. Because <laughs> Jesus is a terrible driver. He doesn't take you where you want to go. He just takes you where you need to go. We don't want to accept that. In 2001 is when I had my spiritual reconversion. And until then, even with Naomi, who's my second wife, who was very devout. And she always went to, went to Mass on Sundays, and sometimes with, her, with our little boys. And I never would. I'd say, well, I'm going to pray at St. Mattress of the Springs with my Bloody Mary today. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so it was a gradual process. So let me ask you the surrender portion of this. Right. Um, for those who don't know your struggle, you, you get the throat cancer, you're sitting on the curb, you got the flies flying in your trach tube, and right. you describe it so well in your book, and you, you really talk about that moment of sobbing and, and surrendering. Um, but there had to be more to it than that. It couldn't have just been that moment. You, you say there's a tug that existed that you didn't want to be this person in Hollywood right. making these choices. Where does the surrender point come that you let God win? Well, um, I, I think it did come um, after my cancer surgery. Um, the, uh, they told me that if I didn't stop smoking and drinking, I'd die. Right? I found it impossible to do that. I mean, the, uh, I, was, I was a four-pack-a-day smoker. Thankfully, I'd given up the cocaine, but I was drinking un, un, unthankful amounts of alcohol. Um, and I couldn't, I just couldn't stop. And finally, finally I, I had that moment of catharsis on that curb. And, and, uh, and, and this is after months of realizing that I, I can't do this, I'm not able to do this. And I said, please, God, help me. Yeah. And it was that moment, that incredible moment, you know, that, uh, that will live in my heart forever, I think. And, God's but it's become, it's become easier for me to say, please, God, help me as in through the years. Well, because you, know, so. you, because you know what life is like, right? What would you say your greatest advice is for somebody who is at a point in their life where they're struggling with addiction and they're struggling right. with, these, with their own inadequacies and they know they want to be better? How can they take the same path and how can they surrender in a way that they, they either think right now in this moment watching this saying, I don't believe it. Or they're saying, I want that so badly and I don't know how to do it. Um, well, I think you do have to get to that moment of surrender and, and to emptying yourself in, in, in a certain way. But more importantly, I think you have to specifically and, and in a very hard-nosed way ask God to help you. And then you have to, if you fall off the wagon, whatever wagon it is, whether it's dope or booze or whatever, fall off, it's okay, get back up. Yeah. It's okay to fall off three or four times. Just keep asking God to help you and get back on. Keep fighting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Brennan Manning once said that, um, you know, I know that I've done nothing to earn nor deserve Christ's love. Right. You know, right. Um, he's a great writer, refers to people as the ragamuffin. Right? Yes, and, and I, think and I that, love that phrase. I love the word, and I, I think it's great. Yeah. I think it's true because no matter how far we run into the right. arms of Christ, yes. there is still something pulling at us that, causes us to make bad decisions one yeah. way or the other we right. we sit back at the end of the day and we have to have that contrition we have to have that confession with ourselves and our conversation with God to apologize for what we have done and what we have failed to do I think in some ways the, the ancient Manichaean vision of, of life being a constant struggle between God and the enemy yeah. is valid you know I've, I've spent a lot of my time through the years in my journalism where I was a police reporter for years I'm at Rolling Stone, um, the, uh, where I was five years, but I spent a lot of time around the presence of evil. I interviewed Charlie Manson, you know, and sat in a room with him for two days. 
Um, and, uh, and I'll never forget it because it put chills down my spine and I felt a palpable sense of evil. Yeah. And I, then I did that with a lot of police stories that I covered with shootings and, and really bad things. And I, and I grew up in the refugee camps from the time I was a kid and I saw a lot of bad things there too. Evil exists in the world. Yeah. And it's palpable and it's out there. And I think that if, if we live our lives realistically and with some gravitas, we will understand that it's there and we have to guard against it. I don't believe that we need to tell people what God can do for them. I don't believe that. I don't believe that we need to look at people and say, let me tell you what Jesus can do for you. Because I think everybody knows what Jesus can do for them. We just need to show them when he's already done it. That is a beautiful aspect of life that we don't have to be God. When we try to evangelize, when we go and we share the word, we don't have to be God to these people. We don't need to have all the right answers. As much as we're asking them to surrender to a life in Christ, we have to surrender to know that God is God. His will be done, not ours. Paul was not Paul when we read about him first in the Bible. He was Saul. He was not a maker of tents who brought souls to Christ and led people to heaven. He was a persecutor of Christians. If that man could be converted into the saint that he is today, knocked off of his horse for doing things that were immoral and unjust, if he could go back and deliver more than half of the New Testament, think about what God can do in your life. My friends, it's time to be restored. Commit yourself. Allow yourself to pray to God in new ways, to listen to Him. And the surrendering process isn't to make us comfortable. It's to make us free. Freedom found in here that leads to here for you and for me. What drives you to attend Mass every day? It's the Eucharist. And I need to eat His flesh and to drink His blood. Yeah. I need that on a daily basis, right? Yeah. And then on, on days I go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, I feel that lack. You know? yeah. So, yeah. You described it once uh, that you were like a spiritual vampire uh, craving the right. blood of Christ and, and the body of Christ. Explain to people that don't understand the Catholic view of the Eucharist why receiving him becomes so important. I can explain that easily to people who are alcoholics or dry drunks who aren't drinking anymore but are always an alcoholic for the rest of your life, or to people who've had addictions because that's, they, 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 it's the same syndrome. You know, you, you, I physically need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, and if I don't do that, my day's off. I, I get up in the morning totally differently knowing that I'm going to receive the Eucharist, um, and it, it has shapes my day. Yeah. Um, the I never, in my previous life, and I know it's a dramatic way to talk about that, but but it's true. In my previous sure. life, um, I never got up with great joy. Yeah. You know, I got up either needing a line or a cigarette or or you know a fast shot or something like that. To, yeah. To, but then, and uh, and, uh, and the joy wasn't there. Now it is. Well, it's filled, with, it's filled with the deadly sins. You know, I, I think that when we talk about sin or we talk about um, spiritual warfare, people get freaked out. They get turned off. Right. You know, they, they think that that's some cop-out, that you're always trying to make an excuse that the devil is real or that evil is in our lives causing us to do things that uh, we don't want to do. And we do give into it. It's free will, right? right. We make that choice. Right. But you lived a life that was filled with the sins, the excess, the gluttony, you know, the, the lust, the, the things like that. So that takes place of God. All that takes place of God and God is love and he's ultimately joy. So it makes sense to me uh, that that would exist and it's okay to talk about it as your former life because I think that if you asked Paul, who gave, gives us half of the New Testament, and you said, hey, what was life like for you as a, as a follower of Christ versus a crucifier of Christ or a you know, crucifier yes. of his people, yes. he would tell you, in my former life, this is who I was. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I think that that's the perfect statement. All right, last question. What's your greatest joy about being a dad? 
um, the moment when I can turn them loose as birds and I begin to watch them fly and think, oh, thank God. Thank God I didn't fall off the wire all yeah. the way through as a parent. Because you know? I think parenting is a high wire act, essentially. Yeah. Um, and uh, when, that, when, that, when that happens and you see them fly and they can fly, it's just an overwhelming, amazingly powerful feeling. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that who you are as a man and what you've done in your life and taking the road to build a relationship with Christ and to push what some would figure as a, a glitzy, glammy life or, or one that you could have continued to write with the way that you were writing and not changing that. It's just admirable. And, and I know you as a man, as a friend, as a brother, and you're an incredible father. And uh, thanks for being a great example for me uh, in living a life of faith. Thank you. Our friendship is really wonderful, and I thank God for it. As Fulton Sheen often said to people, God love you. That was one of my favorite conversations to have today with Joe. You know, as a friend, we've had many conversations about life and family, but today to hear a little bit more of his story and the way that he was willing to surrender or to fight off his addictions, even though he wanted the glitz and the glamour of that Hollywood lifestyle, I think is an inspiration for all of us. There's things that we're drawn to and things that we want and things that we think will bring us joy, but ultimately they only lead us further away from who God wants us to be. And we can't find happiness that way. So let me ask you, what are the things in your life right now that are going on that you need to let go of? Who are the friends that maybe you need to distance yourself from that aren't helping you be the best version of who you want to be and who the family man is that, or family woman that you're called to be? Today, let Joe serve as that opportunity for you to know that no matter what you're dealing with, you can get through it if you simply ask God to come into your life. May God meet you everywhere that you desire him always. Until next time, God bless.